Hello and welcome to my channel IELTS Listening. Let's start with one of the best practice tests for improving listening skills. In four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. Jack is on his way to Margaret's house party. He is phoning her for directions. First, you'll have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Jack has got lost on his way to Margaret's party. He is phoning her for directions. Hello, is that Margaret? Yes, who's speaking? Margaret, it's Jack. I think I'm lost. I can't see a signpost and... Jack, so where are you now? Well, I'm a bit confused about the directions, but I'm at a T-junction. What can you see around you? I can see a pub on the corner. Can you see the name of the pub? Wait a minute. Let me see. It's hard to see in the dark. Yes, I can read it now. It's called the Lion's mm, Head. Oh, the Lion's Head. OK, well, then you're not too far away. Go straight ahead through the traffic lights to the next T-junction. Sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? I said, just go through to the next T-junction. OK. Now what? Well, there's a park in front of you and a large two-storey building on the corner. Ah, uh, yes, I can see them. OK. So now turn left. Hang on. You're coming up the street, so you'll have to turn right. OK, got it. What's the name of your street? It's Wesley Street. W-E-S-L-E-Y, number 70. We're the fifth house on the left. You should see a red letterbox and some bushes in front of the house. OK. Fifth house, number 70. I should be there soon. Am I late for the party? It sounds like things are happening there. No, it's only just started. That's good. I should be there in the next ten minutes. See you soon. Jack hangs up and walks on. Seven minutes later, he calls Margaret again, as he still can't find the house. You now have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. As you listen, answer questions 6 to 10. speaking. Hi Margaret, it's Jack again. Sorry to bother you. Listen, would you mind doing me a favour? Of course, what? Could you tell Mike I have got his camera? I've tried to send him a text message but it's not going through. Oh, he's not here yet. Oh dear, he said he'd be there early. He might be lost too. OK, I'll call him. What's his number? 0482 563379. Oh, so that's 0485 no, no, 0482 563379. Okay, I'll call him right away. But where are you now? Well, I'm in your street, but I still can't find your house. I can't see the numbers very clearly, or a red letterbox. It's pretty dark. I thought you said it was easy to find. Oh, okay, wait there. I'll come outside and get you. All right then, and don't worry about calling Mike. I'll try to call him now. Hang on, there's someone coming down the street. It looks like Mike. Oh, and I can see the letterbox now. It was hidden behind a bush. See you soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk about keeping children safe on the internet. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Thank you for coming. It's good to see so many of you interested in keeping your children safe on the internet. What's in store? Well, firstly, I'm going to talk in general about some common sense ideas and rules for young ones using the computer. Then, I'll give you some information on free educational websites. Finally, we'll finish with question time. I'm sure most of you think that the internet can be a frightening place in which to let your children roam loose, but let me remind you that it can also be a fountain of knowledge and education. The trick is to avoid the former and utilize the latter. There are programs available both in your local electronics supply shop and free to download that will keep your child safe to a certain degree on the World Wide Web. A popular one is Online Family Norris, which bars things like military and social websites. I wouldn't advise you to rely solely on a program to protect your family, though. As good as it is. You cannot abdicate your responsibility as a parent. I'm sure you all know that, or you wouldn't be here. When all is said and done, the the best way to keep children safe is to educate them and keep an eye on them. For this reason, you should make sure the computer which your child uses is kept in a communal space, where you can look over their shoulder from time to time. It is paramount that you teach them. Never to divulge their proper or full name, and to never provide personal information such as where they live or what their phone number is. Tell them that online friends must remain just that, online, unless they are supervised. It is difficult, I know, to teach children about the dangers of the world when they are so naive, so trusting, and innocent. But without going into great detail, you must alert them to the possibility that the people they are chatting with may not be who they say they are. It's also sensible not to give them their own email address until they are old enough to use the internet safely. So all communication from websites will go through you. When they are old enough to use social sites like Facebook and MySpace, teenagers need to know that whatever postings they put on the web will remain accessible forever. Nothing is ever really deleted there, and embarrassing pictures or remarks may come back to haunt them one day. For instance, when they apply for a job. They could jeopardize their chances, as the employer or human resources staff will look on the web to find out more about their potential employee, and they may be shocked by what they find there—not the sort of stuff an applicant would want on his or her CV. It can also make them more vulnerable to bullying. Unfortunately, bullying on social sites is another thing to look out for. And I have to tell you, it's on the increase. It's a very difficult issue to deal with, but something that is more easily detected if the computer is kept in a family space. If we can put these negative issues aside, let's not forget that the internet is also a wonderful place for children of all ages. Teenagers may be mostly networking on social sites. Or completing research that they've been asked to do as part of their homework assignments, but younger children can get assistance with mathematics, 
spelling, and reading on a variety of free and paid-for sites. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. A good way for children to learn and have fun at the same time is the website mathtutor.com. They can practice mathematics on this site, no matter what their level, while they compete against other children from all over the world. And here's a fun way for primary school children to learn the spelling words for the week. It can be such a chore for some children. They just type them in and play games to learn them. What's that? The website? Oh, sorry, yes, you'll need to go to spellcity.com for that. The one I'm going to tell you about now is one of the most practical sites that's popular with people of all ages. Children or parents, for that matter, can learn to touch type as they sing along with songs. And there's a variety of funny characters to help you enjoy yourself as you learn. In this day and age, typing is essential. Everyone should be able to type fast and accurately. So, go to beeb.co forward slash typing and try it out. Don't just leave it up to the kids. Here's a site that parents can use to download worksheets to extend their children by giving them further practice. It's called coolresources.com and I can really recommend it, particularly for middle school students. Now, are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation about waste between a tutor and a student. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 23. Well, we've been looking at the issue of waste this term, and as you know, it's a huge area to research. Now, Hannah, just to recap on our last session, we identified a range of sources of waste. Can we just run through these very briefly before we make a start? Yes. I've got a note of them here. We've got waste from industry, commerce, quarrying and construction. And then, of course, there's household bins and litter. Great. Now, you were going to focus on industrial waste, weren't you? How's the research going? Well, actually, I decided to go with household waste in the end and focus on food. I've been looking at exactly what we throw out and how much. Now... Maybe this won't come as much of a surprise to you, but I was really amazed at just how much food we throw away in the UK. We throw away over 7 million tonnes of food every single year. 7.2 million to be exact. That's quite right. In the latest survey, it's been estimated that we're wasting one third of the food we buy. Exactly. That's like one in every three bags of food shopping going straight into the bin. A 
think the worst thing about it is that more than half of this is food we could actually have eaten. So to give you some examples, things like unopened pots of yogurt, whole chickens. Yes, people actually throw out whole chickens. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions twenty-four to thirty. Now, have you got any figures to support this? It's important to include these in your final assignment. Yes, I've got a note of them somewhere. Yes, here they are. Let's start with yogurts. Now, one point three million of them go straight in the bin. And five and a half thousand whole chickens. Oh, and I've got another example: bread. An amazing seven million slices of bread are completely wasted too. Okay, you've got some solid figures there. And don't forget to explore the reasons why we throw out food we haven't even opened. One interesting point worth making here is that. Basically, we often completely forget about what we've bought, so we stick the box of eggs in the fridge and our packets of biscuits at the back of the cupboard, and they just lie there, completely unused. And on the subject of eggs, you might be shocked to learn that we throw away 0.7 million of them every single day, and the same amount of packets of biscuits. I think that people need to think more about how they are storing and using the food they buy. That's a good point. What do you think is the problem there? Do we all need to change our attitude to food? Definitely. Part of the problem is that we've come to expect our food to look uniform and, well, perfect. So we want our apples to be green all over and to be a certain shape and size. This means the farmers, and then we as consumers, end up throwing away perfectly good food just because it has a blemish or a mark. What's wrong with a green apple that has some red colour on it too? What's wrong with a tomato that has a slightly strange shape? But that kind of attitude may explain why there is so much waste. In fact, these are exactly the foods we waste most of. We throw out far more of those than we do bakery items like cakes and biscuits. And just to give you some idea of quantities, we're throwing out 5.1 million whole potatoes, 4.4 million whole apples, and 2.8 million whole tomatoes on a daily basis. And then there are the sell-by and use-by dates. They encourage us to throw away food long before it goes off. Thanks, Hannah. You've highlighted an interesting point: that waste is very much a social issue. Okay, let's leave it there. We can look at the issue of initiatives to reduce waste next. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk from a series of lectures on the survival of our planet. Professor Samson talks about endangered species of flora and fauna. First, you'll have half a minute to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today's topic in this series of lectures on our planet is about ensuring the survival of our very important plant and animal species. In this lecture, I want to discuss one way that we can do this. No one will ever see a huge dinosaur thundering through the forest. No one will ever see a paradise parrot flash its rainbow colours across the sky. The fact is that many animals and plants have been wiped out. Sadly, they are extinct. It is too late for them. Extinction is forever. We can't do anything about the species that have already disappeared. But today, there are many animals and plants that could still become extinct in the future if we do not act now. They are endangered. The African elephant and rhinoceros have become endangered because of the value of their tusks. Australian parrots and reptiles are smuggled onto planes because certain people in other countries are prepared to pay thousands of dollars for them. And there are many other species around the world that are endangered because they no longer have a place in which to live and reproduce safely. The main cause of extinction is the destruction of habitats. A habitat contains all that a living thing needs to survive. Space, light, water, food, shelter, and opportunities for reproduction. The population of the world is growing rapidly, and this is placing great demands on land and resources for housing and for growing food. When vegetation is cleared and swamps are drained for agriculture, mining and suburbs, or when rivers are dammed to store water, plants are destroyed and animal life is threatened. In other words, humans are changing and destroying the habitats of animals and plants, which is in turn reducing their chances of survival. So how can we conserve habitats and help save endangered species? Well, one way is to protect their habitats permanently in national parks or nature reserves. National parks have been created in many countries. They encourage people to enjoy the beauty and diversity of the animals and plants that live there without harming them. By supporting and visiting these parks, people can become more aware of the species that live there and how the parks work to protect them. It is very important that, when visiting a national park, we keep them safe for future generations of plants and animals by obeying a few rules. Firstly, follow the fire regulations. Don't throw cigarettes or build fires, except at certain times of the year in especially allocated areas and facilities. Secondly, remember to leave pets at home. Pets, such as cats or dogs, can hunt birds or other small animals. Some pets might even escape and become a serious threat. Thirdly, place all rubbish in a bin or take it home. Plastic bags or leftover food are dangerous to the animals and harm the environment. Don't pick the flowers or damage the plants. Flowers create the next generation of the plant. Also, for the same reason, birds' eggs must be left in their nests. The loss of species in the past is sad. However, there is hope for the future. Despite the demands of our increasing population, we can work to protect the plant and animal species we still have. So I would like to conclude by saying that I believe that, with strong public awareness and support of these national parks and reserves, the future of endangered species can be ensured. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Dear viewers, thank you for taking this listening test. Please let me know about your score in the comments section below. Keep on practicing. It's the only way to be successful. We are planning to upload more IELTS helpful videos. Please subscribe to our channel, IELTS Listening. Thank you.